My themes for uh, these four lectures are spatial experience and virtual reality. If you're not quite clear what those topics have to do with each other, um, I hope it will become clear as things go along. I'll start with a, uh, I'll try to frame this with a very general question about the mind and its relationship to the world. How does the mind represent the world? And a bit more specifically, what are the fundamental points of contact between the mind and concrete reality? What is this, the basic connection between the mind and the world? Where is our basic grip on reality? That's a general question, but it's very, one can very quickly get into a more specific question here tied to space, because it's very natural to hold that space plays a really central role in the way the mind represents the world. So I want to focus in on the question, how does the mind represent space in perception, in thought, and in language? And in particular, do we have a direct grasp on space as it is in itself? It's very natural to take the view that we do have some kind of direct intrinsic understanding of space and spatiality and we represent our world fundamentally as a spatial world. I want to approach this, uh, this question from a couple of different directions. In the first two lectures, I'm going to approach the question by thinking about spatial illusions, cases in which we misperceive space and get the spatial locations of things wrong. I'm going to argue that there are certain limits to spatial illusions, although spatial illusions can be quite rife and complex. There are certain limits on how badly we can get space wrong. As a result, I'll argue, there are certain limits to how badly we can go wrong about external reality. This will, along the way, yield some limits on some very traditional epistemological phenomena in philosophy, such as skepticism about the external world, which is basically tied to the idea that we could be getting the external world completely wrong. I'm going to argue, although there's something to that Cartesian intuition, um, correct thinking about space suggests really there are some limits to how badly we can get things wrong, and therefore some limits on external world skepticism. The key theme here across these lectures is going to be what I call spatial functionalism. Many of you will be familiar from, uh, with functionalism and the philosophy of mind, understanding the mind and mental states in virtue of its causal role. So for example, belief is whatever plays the belief role. Desire is whatever plays the desire role. Well, spatial functionalism says roughly space is whatever plays the space role. And that at a certain level, our grasp of space, I'm going to suggest, is as whatever plays a certain role. So instead of having a categorical or primitive grasp on space, as one might have thought pre-theoretically, our grasp on space is somewhat more indirect, somewhat more structural. And I'm going to suggest that has some serious consequences. In the philosophy of mind and language, I think spatial functionalism helps us to understand the representation of space in perception, thought, and language. In the second lecture, for example, I'm going to argue this leads to a certain externalist view of the content of spatial experience. In epistemology, I think this spatial functionalism helps us respond to the skeptic about the external world. And in metaphysics and the philosophy of science, it helps us understand the place of space in non-classical physics, such as relativity, quantum mechanics, and string theory. That's a theme I'll get to in the third lecture. And in virtual reality, where one can find at least a functionally construed version of space, even in a virtual reality. And this connects, in turn, to certain themes in the philosophy of technology and cognitive science in making sense of virtual reality and computation. So here's the plan for the four lectures. Today is going to be a bit of a gentle introduction, not really getting into the issues in their full depth, but starting to think about the place of perception in virtual 
reality um, and the possibility of spatial illusions there. In the second lecture, I'll start looking at spatial illusions in somewhat more depth, thinking about the possibility of certain permanent uh, spatial illusions, whether one could be getting orientation and size and shape wrong for one's entire lifetime. And I'll be arguing there are certain limits to those spatial illusions. Um, that's next Tuesday. The third lecture next Thursday will perhaps be the central one, where I try to put some of the pieces together in arguing for a certain kind of spatial functionalism, arguing we can use this to kind of locate and understand the place of space, even in worlds which are fundamentally non-spatial, such as arguably the worlds described by quantum mechanics and string theory. And I'll bring that to bear on questions of the place of space in virtual reality and on questions about skepticism. In the final lecture, I guess which will be Tuesday about two weeks from now, I'm going to examine some of the philosophical, the broader philosophical underpinnings, which is a kind of overarching structuralism, understanding the world in terms of its structure, both applied to specific domains, such as computation and the concept of space, and underlying all this is structuralism more generally about our grasp on reality. But hopefully all this will become much clearer over the course of the two weeks to come. Today, the theme is spatial illusions, and I'm going to be concentrating on two domains, the domains of mirrors, the domain of mirrors, which I'll then use to lay the groundwork for a corresponding investigation of virtual reality. So I've been getting very interested in virtual reality lately. I mean, it's a topic which has been very much in the news lately, as virtual reality technology seems finally to be making it to the consumer level. It's also a, an issue which can be used to raise many different philosophical problems and to raise many of the traditional problems of philosophy as well as some new ones. So what is virtual reality? Well, virtual reality technology to a first approximation is technology that produces experiences as of an external reality grounded in a computer simulation of reality. So here is the, uh, here's one of the, the, uh, the best known virtual reality devices around at the moment. This is the Oculus Rift. And the guy that's wearing it is Palmer Lucky, the CEO of Oculus, a company which was just formed about three years ago and has rapidly become the leader in virtual reality technology to the point where they were bought out by Facebook um, a year or so ago for $2 billion. Um, Facebook apparently sees them as the, you know, sees virtual reality as, among other things, the future of social networking technology. In the future, we'll all be socializing together in virtual reality. Um, I actually bought myself one of these uh, Oculus Rifts about six months ago, and now I find myself obliged to give lectures like this in order that I can justifiably charge it to my research account. Um, so, it, so the Oculus Rift is basically, it's a headset with a, something like a smartphone on the inside with images on two halves of the screen. And you're seeing both those two images up very close with a certain algorithm to render a precise stereoscopic image. So you get the sense of 3D vision along with very sophisticated head tracking. So the image moves as the head moves, um, very fast processing so that you've got a very realistic sense of being embedded in a virtual world, at least visually, and with headphones auditorily. Um, oh, here's me inside a virtual reality suit. In, uh, in, I visited Betty Moller's lab in Tübingen earlier this year. They put me in a, uh, this is much more sophisticated than the Oculus Rift. This involves putting on a full virtual reality bodysuit with uh, 17 sensors over uh, different bits of the body. So they've got an accurate body image for you, which they can then transform in interesting ways. I think at this point, I had just been placed inside a female body, inside the, uh, inside the virtual reality, and I was looking, looking down at my delicate, pointy feet. Um, so, okay, so virtual reality is fascinating and a lot of fun. It also, as I said, raises many of the deepest issues in philosophy. I mean, it raises epistemological questions, like uh, the old question, uh, might we be in a virtual reality? Can we know that we're not? And if we can't know that, can we know much of anything at all? 
uh, metaphysical questions. What is the nature of virtual objects, the kind of objects one encounters in a virtual reality? It raises questions in the philosophy of language. How to analyze meaning of words in virtual reality, perhaps for subjects that go back and forth between a non-virtual and a virtual reality. Famously, it can be used to raise questions about value. Robert Nozick, in his example of the experience machine, in effect, uses virtual reality to raise the question of whether life in virtual reality is as valuable as life outside it, and to shed light on what our most fundamental values are. You can even use it to raise questions in the philosophy of religion. Just say we are in a virtual reality, such as the matrix, you know, who are our gods? Presumably it's those people who created the simulation we're living in, perhaps some all-powerful machines or perhaps a smelly teenage hacker in the next universe up. But I want to really, uh, today, be using virtual reality to raise some questions about perception and perceptual illusion. The basic question will be, is perceptual experience in virtual reality illusory or is it veridical? That's to say, when perceptually experiencing virtual reality, when having the kind of experiences you have, when you put on an Oculus Rift headset, are things the way they look to be? If they're not, you're having an illusion. If they are, then you're having what philosophers call a veridical experience. I'll focus especially on spatial experience and discuss the question of whether virtual reality involves spatial illusions. I'll argue that it doesn't, or at least that it needn't. And I'll use that to shed light on spatial experience and on space more generally. It's often held to be obvious that virtual reality produces illusions of, a real, of an external reality of a certain sort, or at least try to convince you that it's by no means as obvious as it might have seemed. It's useful at the beginning to make a distinction between two different relations that a subject can stand in to a virtual reality, which you might think of as permanent and temporary embedding in virtual reality. Permanent virtual reality is lifelong embedding in virtual reality, the kind that's you know, roughly depicted at the beginning of the movie The Matrix. So the one's always been in a virtual reality. One's experiences have always had virtual causes. Contrast that with the much more realistic form of virtual reality right now, or you know, who knows, permanent virtual reality may be realistic if indeed we are in a matrix. But uh, assuming we're not, um, the kind of virtual reality which the Oculus Rift confronts us with is temporary virtual reality. Short-lived experiences in virtual reality where one's experiences normally, or at least often, have non-virtual causes. And some of the time, say when we put on the Oculus Rift headset, have virtual causes. So for permanent reality, but virtual reality, there's the famous example of the Matrix. I guess the example is getting a bit uh, long in the tooth now. It's 16 years ago the Matrix came out. Uh, um, I guess there was Inception five or six years ago. Any, any good new virtual reality movies in 2015? Okay, we're still waiting for the next classic. Um, in a paper I wrote about The Matrix in about 2003, I argued for a certain line about uh, permanent virtual reality. I suggested that normal experiences in a permanent virtual reality are non-illusory. The people inside The Matrix, like Neo at the beginning of the movie, have veridical experiences of virtual objects in a virtual space. And I suggest that if we turn out to be living in the matrix, as we could, our ordinary experiences will mostly be veridical and our beliefs will mostly be true. Now, I'm not going to rehearse the arguments of that article in these lectures, but these themes will be very much in the background and the spatial functionalism I'll be developing is really can be seen as continuous with the line I took um, in that article a number of years ago. And I think the best place for an opponent to hold the line against these arguments is by holding the line on space and making the case that we're subject to certain spatial illusions in the matrix. So I think that's really a very useful place to home in on to uh, get at the depths of some of these questions about 
external world skepticism. In any case, today, my topic is not going to be permanent virtual reality. Uh, next Tuesday, I'll be talking about certain kinds of permanent spatial illusions, at least closely related to those issues about permanent virtual reality. But my topic today is uh, a somewhat different one. It's the topic of temporary virtual reality, the kind of experiences had already by users of, say, an Oculus Rift. Are the experiences you have in temporary virtual reality veridical or illusory? So here's a, uh, you know, a user who just started using the uh, Oculus Rift, perhaps for the first time. Say, well, OK, this is pretty cool. Is she having an illusion, or is she having vertical perceptions of virtual reality? My claim is going to be that at least for many users of temporary virtual reality, many or most experiences will not be illusory. There will be some illusions, just as there are with non virtual reality, but at least for experienced and familiar users of temporary virtual reality, many or most experiences won't be illusory. But I, uh, I want to get at this question by spending you know, at least the, the next 10 or 15 minutes thinking about a different topic, the topic of mirrors. And here I want to uh, raise the corresponding question about mirrors. That is, is ordinary experience on looking at a mirror? illusory, or is it veridical? And here I'll be, uh, I'll be pursuing a line very much parallel to the line that, to a line that Roberto Cassati um, here has taken in some recent work about, in thinking about mirrors and the space behind mirrors, where he distinguishes between the epistemically innocent user of a mirror who doesn't know much about mirrors and doesn't know that they're using, about using a mirror, and the experienced user of a mirror who does know they're using a mirror, and arguing that much in the analysis of mirrors turns on that distinction. So here's, uh, here's President Obama looking in a mirror, um, seeing himself in a mirror. And the question is, is he here undergoing an illusion? I mean, on one pretty natural view, he's experiencing a person located on the other side of the mirror, presumably on the other side of the wall, a couple of meters away from him, where nobody is present, and is therefore, he's therefore undergoing an illusion. On another view, he's actually having an experience of himself located roughly where he in fact is, and he's not undergoing an illusion. So an illusion I'll take to be a perceptual experience where things look to be a certain way, and they aren't that way. So a classic illusion would be something like the Mullah Liar, illusion. It looks that one line is longer than the other, but it isn't in reality. So it's an illusion. Or a color illusion is a case where something looks red, but it's actually blue, and so on. And there are many perceptual illusions. They're the bread and butter of much of psychophysics. Um, so here are two views about the experience of looking in a mirror. View one is that when you look in a mirror, it perceptually appears that there are objects so arranged on the far side of the glass when in fact there aren't. So one is having a visual illusion. On a second view, it perceptually appears there are objects so arranged on the near side of the glass where the objects actually are. So one is not having an illusion. I mean, maybe you have a, um, a view yourself of what seems intuitive about this case. My own view is that Certainly both of these views are possibilities, and both apply in different situations. I mean, I think it's clear that in some cases, mirror experiences clearly seem to be illusory. And the most obvious here is the case of the epistemically innocent user of a mirror, someone who doesn't know that a mirror is present. If you don't know that a mirror is present, you can easily be experience things as being on the other side of the mirror as if in a window. So here's a case, for example. This is actually a, uh, a mirror, but encountering it from the, the first time in the right context, one might well take it to be a window. If one doesn't realize it's a mirror, I think it's very natural to hold that one will have an experience as of there being you know, some woods and some trees and so on out there on the other side of the wall through the window. And then you realize it's a mirror, and you realize things weren't that way. 
that was a kind of illusion. And all of us have had this experience of walking into a room and at first not realizing that a certain mirror is a mirror, taking it to be a window, and thereby, for example, taking the room to be much larger than it is, with more people in the room than there are, and so on. So that's a very familiar experience of illusions on looking at a mirror. On the other hand, I think there are some cases that are much closer to being clear cases of non-illusory experiences on looking in a mirror, or at least cases where the claim that it's an illusion gets much less of a grip on us. And I think the paradigm case here might be the case of, uh, of driving a car and looking in a rear view mirror. Or for those of you who ride bikes, hopefully your bike has a mirror, um, just think of this case. So when you're driving a car and looking in a rear view mirror, then do we want to say, do the cars visible in the mirror, do they perceptually appear to be in front of you? Or do they perceptually appear to be behind you. So here, so here we are, driving our car down the street. You look in the rearview mirror. You see some cars which are, in fact, behind you. But what do we want to say about how things perceptually appear? Does it perceptually appear to you that there are these cars in front of you, coming towards you? That's the, presumably if your car kept going in this direction, you'd actually hit sometime before too long. Or does it perceptually appear to you that these cars are behind you, following at a certain safe distance, um, and traveling in the same direction, pointing in the same direction that your car is pointed? I don't know about you, but at least my initial intuition upon looking at this case is where the cars look to be is behind me. The cars, there's just no sense at all of the cars being in front of me, coming towards me. That's a very unnatural interpretation to put on this one's very strong sense is that of the cars behind you, and I'm inclined to say that's where they look to be, in which case it's not an illusion, or at least it's not an illusion of that paradigmatically mirror-oriented sort. Here's another case. Um, looking in the rearview mirror and seeing a sunset behind you. I guess if you're going to take the, uh, the illusion view, then you're going to say that it perceptually seems to you that somewhere down there through the road, you're seeing through a glass, somehow down underneath the road, there's an interesting sub sunset with clouds and the sun down there through the earth shining back up at you towards you, and it seems to you that the sun is somehow setting inside the earth, or maybe there's some more sophisticated gloss on it uh, than this. That would be one view. The other view is that it perceptually appears to you that there's a sunset behind you and behind the car. And again, to me, the second reading um, is by far the most natural one. So my view phenomenal, is that phenomenologically it seems incorrect to say that the cars visible in the mirror appear to be in front of you. Now, I don't have a whole lot of, I'm a little bit embarrassed about this after Uriah's very kind and generous introduction where he told you how I was going to be incredibly fairly review all the options and give, then give a detailed and painstaking argument for one of the views. I don't have a whole lot of argumentation here. I've really just got a phenomenological intuition, intuition to report, which I think one can, uh, one can buttress with a bit more phenomenology and comparison of relevant cases. But I think this intuition is a uh, very powerful one, and most people I've talked to about this share it at least to a considerable degree. Um, now, of course, proponents of the illusion view won't be left with nothing to say. They'll be inclined to, a proponent of the illusion view can say something like the following. Well, we, in these cases, we judge that for the car or the sunset is behind us. We form the belief that the car is behind us. Nevertheless, the car looks to be ahead of us. It's a bit like the Mulalaya illusion, where one line is longer than the other. It's a perceptual illusion, but you still form the belief that the lines have the same length, because you know about Mulalaya illusions. Likewise, you know about mirrors, so you're not taken in by the illusory perceptual appearance. Another variation on this line, perhaps a little bit more sophisticated, is to agree that the car looks to be behind us. But say that's because looks claim in ordinary English, and I suppose the same is plausibly true of corresponding claims in French and other languages. Those claims involve some contribution from judgment. 
as well as perceptual appearance. The truth conditions of a looks claim depends partly on how one judges things to be, as well as how things perceptually appear to be or how things are represented to be in perception. But nevertheless, that perception represents them as a head. And I'll say there's a layer here of perceptual representation and phenomenology on which they're represented as ahead of you, and a layer of judgment where the cars are represented as behind you. I think this is an interesting and important line, but I am inclined to think this just gets the perceptual phenomenology wrong. And one way to get at this is by looking at cases where mirrors do yield illusions, even when you know it's a mirror. It's certainly not the case that whenever you know it's a mirror, you escape the illusion effect. There are cases where mirrors yield illusions, and the, the illusion survives even when you know it's a mirror. So here's one case. Uh, apologies for the slightly creepy example, which I uh, downloaded off the web. Here's a case where, okay, it's a mirror, and you're seeing grass in the mirror, and you know this perfectly well. Nonetheless, there's a very powerful illusion here, which is hard to escape, which is that you're seeing, um, which is, you know, you're seeing someone here without, who's missing a torso, and you're seeing the grass at the back, and so on. So there's a very strong illusion here that you're seeing someone with a head and hands and legs, but missing a big chunk of the body. And that is an illusion. I mean, I, I take it that this person is, in fact, holding up a mirror. And I, was, I at least took it that this was a, this really was a mirror reflecting glass. It was pointed out to me by someone recently that maybe, this is, maybe the, the example is actually a fake and that we're not really seeing grass in the mirror, but let's at least go along with the idea that it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really reflecting some, uh, some grass on, a, on an angle very carefully arranged so that the grass, the, the end of the grass there is continuous to the end of the grass above. And so nonetheless, even upon knowing all this, you don't really escape uh, the illusory phenomenology. In this case, it's very powerful. Here's another example. This is the mirror box. Um, experiment, which some of you will be familiar with, when you know your uh, your arms are both down here, and there's a big mirror there, and uh, you're in fact seeing your left hand in the mirror. There's the, there's the beginning of your right arm, but you don't see your your right hand at all. What you see in the mirror is in fact your left hand. But people threaten that hand in various ways in the mirror, and you very there's a very strong effect of perceiving this as happening to your right hand, and you flinch in various ways and so on. So although you know it's a mirror, and you know it's not your right hand that you're seeing, it's very plausible that you perceive things happening to your, your right hand. You're under the perceptual illusion that things are happening to your right hand there. And that survives the knowledge that it's a mirror. And you know, I think insofar as there's an argument here, it's like, OK, in these cases, you've got the phenomenology of illusion. There very much is the phenomenology of something going on behind the mirror in these cases of illusion. In the car case, the phenomenology is just not like that at all. It doesn't, you know, uh, to me, it just doesn't seem right to say that it perceptually appears or even that it's perceptually represented as all this is going on through the mirror on the other side. One's very, one's overwhelming perceptual sense is of things going on behind you. So what are the key features of the car case that differentiates it from the cases of, of illusion? that make it a plausible case, sorry, of non. What I should have said here is we've got these various cases of illusion, like uh, the window at the beginning, uh, the, the case of the grass, and the mirror box. What makes the car case different from these to make the diagnosis of illusion less plausible? Well, I don't have a set of necessary and sufficient conditions, but it seems there are a few relevant factors here. One is the factor that uh, Roberto discusses in his work, the factor of knowledge. We know it's a mirror. Second, and going along with this, is a certain kind of familiarity with mirrors. We're used to using the mirror. I mean, maybe the very first time you use a mirror, someone tells you it's a mirror, it doesn't immediately make the illusion that there's something going on on the other side go away. That takes a certain process of familiarity and getting used to using the mirror, perhaps central to that process is a certain kind of action dependence. So where one's disposition to act in certain ways depend on understanding of the mirror as a mirror. I think that's certainly one of the things that makes the rear view mirror case such a good case. Um, you know, we're used to, we've got to steer, we've got to react very quickly and directly depending on what we see in the mirror. 
If a car is coming up, if a truck is barreling through behind us, we've got to get out of the way, and so on. We've got a very finely tuned set of action dispositions that depend on the mirror. Maybe uh, another factor worth mentioning is that in many of these cases, the scene presented on the in front of interpretation is quite unnatural. I think it's very unnatural. I mean, what would, trying to read this as a sunset through the road, it's just very hard to make sense of that. And I think the visual system and one's whole cognitive system just cavils at making sense of that. Whereas in some other cases, well, in this case, of course, the, uh, the representation of the human body is quite unnatural, but there's still the, at least the naturalness of that horizon of grass to combat it, maybe make, plays some role in giving one the powerful sense that there is a, uh, you're seeing through to the, uh, to the grass there, which is an illusion. Sorry. Um, so those are at least four relevant factors there. Knowledge, familiarity, action, dependence, and naturalness. I won't try and give an exhaustive analysis of which is the most central. Though I'm inclined to think that action dispositions do play a central role here. You can argue, I think, that this is a case of what philosophers call cognitive penetration. Philosophers and psychologists call cognitive penetration of perception. Cognitive penetration is that phenomenon roughly where what goes on in cognition makes a difference to how things seem in perception. And paradigmatically, where what one knows or believes makes a difference to how things are perceived as being. And there's been a debate on this ever since the 1950s that's still going very strong today about whether there is such a thing as cognitive penetration of perception. There's any number of purported cases that people have put forward as cases where knowledge or belief makes a, uh, makes a difference to how things seem, and then the opponents always say, oh no, it's not really an effect on perception, just an effect on judgment, and the debate goes on. I'm inclined to think that the mirror case is as good as any a potential case um, for the cognitive penetration of perception. One can get at this by thinking of a contrasting pair of cases. Two near identical subjects, two near identical cases involving a subject looking into a mirror. In case one, the subject knows it's a mirror and so has the non-illusory perception of objects as being in front of the glass. Case two is very similar except for the cognitive background. The subject doesn't know it's a mirror and experiences objects as being behind the glass. I mean, maybe we could set this up with, oh, I mean, here's, a, here's a case, um, you know, in case one, Subject walks into the room and knows it's a, uh, it's a mirror and experiences all this stuff is going on over there. Case two, the subject, at least at first, doesn't know it's a mirror, experiences this as a window and experiences all that is going on through there. And I think I can make a very plausible case that the perceptual appearances are just different in this case as a result of the difference in cognition. One could also, you know, try and set up a case involving maybe the rear view mirror to make it a bit uh, a bit purer, where you've got a little window in front of you, it could be a giant mirror that you're told is projecting you know, what's going on behind you, or it could be in window mode where you're seeing what's ahead of you, and your action dispositions will be very, very different as a result. In one case, you see the stuff as being behind you. In the other case, you see it as being ahead of you. So this, it looks like in these cases, depending on whether or not one believes it's a mirror, objects seem to be ahead or behind oneself. If you want to reject the cognitive penetration line here and say there's never a cognitive penetration through the use of mirrors, through knowledge of a mirror, I think you probably have to deny that objects ever seem to be behind oneself in a mirror and pretty well say that in every case of mirror perception, objects appear to be out there through the mirror and just take the line that all that is corrected at the level of judgment but not at the level of perceptual representation. And again, that's the line that I find phenomenologically implausible. There is an interesting question as to whether the phenomenology of the experience actually changes uh, when you know it's a mirror and when you're familiar with the mirror. I'm inclined to think, and I've already been making appeals to phenomenology, I'm inclined to say that yeah, there is some change in the phenomenology when it phenomenologically appears to be on this side of the mirror, something about what it's like to have the experience changes in which case you get cognitive penetration of perceptual phenomenology. But just say you want to say no to that, and you say, well, ah, the content changes, but the phenomenology doesn't, which is a respectable line. Then you'd have an equally interesting conclusion, which is that there's a change in perceptual representation here without a change in phenomenology, which would be interestingly problematic for various popular theories of phenomenal representation. 
So I call this phenomenon the cognitive orientation of perception. It's a certain kind of cognitive penetration, an, eff an effect where cognition, in effect, is making a difference to the sort of background assumptions by which the perceptual si system is interpreting the orientation of the whole scene. So background knowledge here is determining the general orientation of how things seem to be in the perceptual experience. That orientation changes with changes in what one knows or believes. So perception changes with changes in what one knows or believes. I keep saying knows or believes, but I, I guess I'm, it seems plausible that it's really belief that makes the difference here rather than knowledge. Cases of false belief, falsely believing something is a mirror will work just as well as cases of truly believing or knowing. It's a mirror. I mean, there's an interesting question here about the connection to familiar phenomena of perceptual adaptation. Uh, the old familiar case of inverting goggles, for example, which flip the lens, uh, flip the image on the retina. So initially, one sees things as upside down. That seems pretty clearly to be an illusion. But after some time, after a few days wearing these inverting goggles, we're told people adapt to this, and everything seems normal. A closer to home case is the case of convex mirrors, which you know, make things seem smaller and uh, further away. Um, but over time, you adapt to using those. Interesting question as to whether there's cognitive orientation in these cases as well. I mean, one difference is this whole process with inverting goggles seems a lot slower. But it's an interesting question whether for, I suppose it's an empirical question to which I don't know the answer, whether for users of really experienced users of inverting goggles, will very quickly be able to go back and forth between uh, you know, wearing the goggles and flipping things and not wearing the goggles and not flipping things and maybe someone gives them some goggles and tells them they're, that they're the inverting goggles and for a moment they flip things until they realize, oh no, these are non-inverting goggles and they flip it back. If it was like that, then it really would be a bit like the phenomenon of cognitive orientation. Now it may be that some illusions run much deeper than the phenomena with mirrors and, and, and inversion with goggles runs much deeper so you don't get the quick kind of cognitive orientation here. A flip side would be, you know, sh can we see what goes on with ordinary mirrors as a kind of perceptual adaptation? Or maybe the initial use of mirrors over, uh, you know, the first few days of becoming familiar with mirrors is a kind of perceptual adaptation where things gradually come to seem to be this side of the mirror where things are. And then later on, once that's set up, then there's this immediate perceptual adaptation to knowing something is a mirror versus knowing it's a, uh, it's a window when you have the relevant uh, relevant knowledge. Again, I don't want to suggest nothing, you know, cognitive orientation doesn't work for every illusion. It doesn't make every illusion go away. The bent stick still looks bent uh, after, all, after all this time, but there is this interesting class for which it produces this kind of adaptation and I, I'd suggest loss of illusion. One can generalize a bit. Uh, side viewing mirrors at 45 degrees in front of you, then I think with appropriate knowledge and familiarity, objects will seem to be off to the left or to the right. Um, one could extend to video screens. I mean, there are already plenty of cars now that have video screens that show what's going on behind you. There's a camera on the back of the car, and you look on the video screen, and you see what's going on behind you. And I think that what I've said about mirrors very plausibly extends to that. So there's a video screen showing what's behind you, then objects there seem, there seem to be behind you. Likewise, video screens in front showing objects off to the side, with appropriate cognitive background, objects will seem to be to the side. And on it goes. I think the phenomenon of cognitive orientation extends. So, yeah, here's a guy that's looking at the screen and can be given the knowledge is it all in front or behind or off to the side. With relevant familiarity, some cues about that could lead to things perceptually seeming to be very different in all of these cases. You can extend to remote video. Video screens in front of you showing cameras attached to remote objects. Um, then I think it's plausible that objects will seem to be in front of those objects. If you know the object is off 100 meters to one side, that's where the scene will seem to be. Likewise, for video screens attached to remote robot bodies, as in that old story of Dan Dennis on Where Am I? Of the robot body, objects will plausibly seem to be in front of the robot. Okay, so that then leads us up to our uh, to uh, the topic I wanted to get to, which is that of virtual reality. What about virtual reality? In the experience of virtual reality, is that a perceptual illusion 
or are things as they seem to be? So here's a you know, new user of virtual reality, and this is a fanciful depiction of seeing a wonderful scene of uh, mountains and so on, where presumably she's in fact alone inside a dark room wearing a headset. So in that paper on the matrix, I argue that if we've been in virtual reality all our lives, things are as they seem to be, and we don't have a spatial illusion. On that line, there are still tables and chairs. They're just ultimately, or they're just constituted by underlying computational processes. That's part of the underlying metaphysics of tables and chairs. If we're in a matrix, which is a bit weird, but no weirder really than being constituted by quantum processes, something we've gotten used to and something we're not really inclined to say makes tables and chairs non-existent or illusory. On my view, if we're in a virtual reality, we really are perceiving virtual objects in a virtual space. They really are virtual objects in data structures in the computer, bringing about our experiences, and we're perceiving those. Virtual objects are real objects, even though they're ultimately constituted by computational processes. In a computer running VR, even a, the kind of computer running the programs on an Oculus Rift, there really is, are virtual objects, data structures, inside that computer, which really are located in a virtual space. I haven't yet said that virtual space is real space, and that virtual objects are on a par with real objects, but I'm inclined, you know, virtual tables are not exactly the same thing as non-virtual tables. Assuming we're not in a VR, then ordinary tables are non-virtual, whereas the tables, when using an Oculus Rift, are virtual. They're made of computational processes. Likewise, if we're not in VR, then virtual space isn't the same as non-virtual space. It's a different kind of thing, computationally constituted versus not. But I'd argue that in a broader sense, it's a sort of space. And this now connects to many of the issues which are going to come up in the later lectures. Underlying that view is a kind of spatial functionalism, where space is what spa space does, or perhaps better, space is what plays the space role. And then the point is going to be that inside a virtual reality, there really is a virtual space, again, you know, perhaps ultimately constituted by certain data structures, but where certain kind of properties, computational properties inside the virtual reality, typically cause certain kinds of spatial experiences in me. That's going to be one of the key roles of space, played by locations inside a virtual space. Also, there'll be certain kind of roles tied to the interaction of objects inside a virtual reality. I want to say that space is partly constituted by, by certain constraints on the interaction between objects. And that kind of pa those patterns of causal interaction will also be present inside a virtual reality. So on a functionalist view of space, you can actually find a space inside virtual reality. But those are going to be the main themes of the second and third lectures, so I won't say more about that for now. And still come back to temporary virtual reality and say, what if one enters virtual reality with or without previous experience, with or without knowing it's a virtual reality? So my view is that the virtual reality case is very much analogous to the mirror case. So one can certainly get illusions in VR, just as one can with mirrors. If you enter a virtual reality without knowing it's a virtual reality, you'll perceive objects as in front of you in ordinary space when the objects aren't there. And that'll be an illusion, just as it is in the case of unknowing use of a mirror. So here's an unfortunate chap who's gotten drunk and someone's putting a Google Cardboard on him, I guess, which is a new VR device where you just put your a Google, Google sends you a box for $20 and you put your Samsung phone inside it and you got kind of very, very cheap use at home virtual reality and this guy's seeing this like, oh my God, it's full of stars. He's having some kind of illusion here and it's blowing his mind. So on my view, even in this case, even when you use a virtual reality unknowingly, you're, you're still perceiving virtual objects those data structures, which are in virtual space. But you're misperceiving them as non-virtual objects in ordinary space, and that's an illusion, because there are no ordinary objects occupying that ordinary space. 
So that's unknowing use of temporary VR. But what about after much time in virtual reality when you know you're in virtual reality? So here's Palmer Lucky again, presumably a very experienced user of virtual reality devices. So I'm inclined to say after some time in virtual reality, you adapt to VR, treating it as a separate space with separate objects. One takes the objects not to be located in ordinary space. One takes them to be located in virtual space as they are. And one even perceives the objects as located in virtual space, too. I mean, one way to help bring this out is that in realistic virtual reality, the kind of VR people are using today, the sensory motor contingencies are quite different from that of ordinary non-virtual reality. The connection between what you perceive and corresponding actions are really quite different. Movement and action involves different sorts of control and special sensory motor dispositions. So I mean, one way which it all comes out, this is just very basic virtual reality, namely a video game on a computer screen, but uh, where we already see some differences here. People typically get around here with, uh, instead of by moving their body, just by you know, twiddling your thumbs on something like a Sony game controller. And even in the Oculus Rift style VR, it's going to be mostly handheld controllers in the, uh, the short term for moving yourself about. So that's how you act. I mean, they are working now on the omnidirectional treadmill where you can, uh, you can kind of hold you, suspend you by the waist and you, can, you move your legs on a treadmill and that's a way to simulate walking in a VR, but that's a whole lot more complicated. This is the simplest way of acting. Um, and likewise, oh, here's me in the, uh, the lab in Tübingen again. In this case, um, well, inside the room, I'm just on a plank on a floor, but in the VR, I'm looking down on a massive chasm it's like, you know, it's the Grand Canyon or something. And then they say, uh, it's like, it's, you, get, you feel a bit of vertigo. And then they say, OK, now step off the plank. It's like, I don't think so. I know perfectly well that I'm, in a, I'm actually in a non-virtual room and there's not far to go. But when they say that, I say, uh, oh, I guess it's safe. And then I walk down onto the, uh, onto the floor. And then suddenly inside the VR, you feel like you're walking on air. Um, so maybe after some time, once you become an, ex an experienced uh, user of the VR, you get used to that, and you get used to walking on, the, on air, and things seem to you to be quite different. But at least at the beginning, um, you know, the ordinary sensory motor contingencies are quite inappropriate for this, this VR. Um, so upon entering VR, I think the experienced user is going to deploy cognitive orientation to the virtual space with its own sensory motor contingencies, treating it as a virtual space, acting differently upon it. As in the mirror case, this plausibly will deploy a special sort, a sort of special representation involving vertical representation of virtual space. I mean, it's actually an interesting question whether this applies that well to the Planck case. Do you really see or sense a, uh, a surface there when there's not? I don't want to, again, I want to allow, there's the possibility of illusions still in VR. But I do think that cognitive orientation to VR makes at least some of these illusions go away. And I think you can make the case that this cognitive orientation to virtual reality is associated with what we might call a distinctive phenomenology of virtuality. That is, of encountering objects that one knows to be virtual. This is especially so for currently realistic VR, where typically objects are visible and even audible. You can talk sometimes, you know, objects will talk back to you in virtual reality, but intangible. You can, you know, you can put your hand right through them or walk right through them. In fact, in this case where I was walking on the plank, there was a, uh, there was the body of a woman present and, I don't know, just looking fairly natural. But then they say, uh, okay, now walk up to her and uh, walk through her. And then I feel very strong social pressure not to, uh, not to do this. I'm sorry, I'm not that kind of guy. But uh, they say, well, let's go on, and then very uncomfortably one walks through this, uh, this body, and then one goes on to walk through walls, and, and so on. So again, bringing out ways in which the, uh, the embodiment and the tangibility of these virtual objects is different. And I think this leads ultimately for experienced users to a different phenomenology of those objects. Part of what we might think of as the phenomenology of virtuality. And indeed, I think you know, it's quite likely that in years to come, 
mixtures of actual and virtual reality go are going to become very common, then one, one might have some of each. So here's, um, this is a version of what people call augmented reality. Uh, this is a technology still under development by a company called Magic Leap, which has taken to projecting virtual objects into the actual world. And this is from one of their, at least one of their marketing campaigns, where you see your real hands and you see a virtual elephant in your real hands. I think it's pretty plausible that, again, the experience, for the experienced user, there are cues that distinguish the real objects from the virtual objects. The virtual objects are perceived as virtual, and the real object, the non-virtual objects are perceived as non-virtual. Sometimes it's going to make sense to perceive them as occupying a, a similar space. Sometimes one will think we'll perceive them as totally different spaces, as when one's engaged in a video game, VR, in a virtual world, but it's also useful to see the other world. In those cases, I think, one might just be perceptually attuned to quite different spaces. Um, there's also a very cool video that was recently released by this company, Magic Leap, where you get to play a first-person shooter inside a, uh, just, you know, basically inside your office, and the monsters and the aliens all appear in the, you know, like, as if in this lecture hall all around you. And somehow you seem quite good at telling the difference. Um, so what about robot virtual reality? Uh, virtual reality coming from a camera on a robot body with your actions controlling that body? I think, you know, plausibly, we already mentioned a, um, a case like that involving non-virtual uh, reality, but the, the headset, I think, is basically very much continuous with the video screen. It's going to be plausibly treated very much like the TV screen on that body. You're cognitively oriented to the robot and thereby accurately perceives the space in front of the robot. And that, I think, interestingly, is so even whether or not there are any special sensory motor contingencies associated with controlling the robot. If you know it's a robot, I think you perceive it as being going on around the robot's body. So even, you know, moving from realistic VR to temporary perfect VR, which we don't have yet, one which really uh, simulates all the sensors perfectly well with the same sensory motor contingencies, even in that case, I'm inclined to think this would be somewhat analogous to a perfect robot case where you're you wander around a body and you control, in fact, a different robot with a different camera. Maybe you go back and forth between the robot sensors and your sensors. I'm inclined to say that in that case, when you know it's coming from the robot, you perceive things as coming from around the robot body. In other cases, you perceive it as coming from your body. Likewise for the VR, you might go back and forth. Virtual reality, non-virtual reality mixes. Um, you, you get pretty good at making the distinction. When you're cognitively oriented to the VR, you're thereby accurately perceiving virtual space. Okay, I think time is running short, so maybe I'll skip over the uh, Fantastic Voyage style cases where everything shrinks, uh, partly because I'm going to be talking about cases like this a bit in the second lecture. Here's the, uh, old, uh, the old movie where the, uh, the spaceship shrinks down and you travel through the uh, blood cells and initially you might have the appearance, oh, there are these huge blood cells out there, but once you know you've shrunk, then plausibly you start accurately perceiving the sizes of objects. There are now virtual realities like this. Here's a virtual reality game I was playing recently where you actually get to wander around the brain. It's the first person neuroscience, it's the first person shooter in the world of neuroscience. You get to, you wander down, you see some diseased neurons out there and you have to orient yourself to the uh, diseased neurons and shoot them and thereby heal your brain. I think like again with cognitive orientation to that VR and the relevant scales, you can be taken to be having, having some kind of accurate perception of the virtual world. So I think as we come to use VR more and more, this view, although perhaps initially counterintuitive, the ones having accurate perceptions of a, visual, of a virtual world, will come to seem increasingly plausible. I'm inclined to think it's something like this is probably already pretty plausible for very experienced video gamers and so on. There will be illusions in VR, but these will be special cases, typically, where action goes wrong. Normal, familiar, expert action will typically be associated with correct perceptual representation of a virtual space. What about people who go back and forth between normal reality and virtual reality? Well, I'm inclined to say as long as they know which is which, you know, if there are relevant cues for when they're in normal reality, when they're in virtual reality, their perception will be cognitively oriented and won't be illusory. You can raise questions about philosophy of language here. The meaning of language as you go back and forth between non-virtual and virtual reality. I'm inclined to say insofar as there are similarities in the two, you know, you see spoons or you see guns or you see tables. In both, 
it's pretty plausible that this will be a kind of context shift for the use of language so that what one's referring to and using these terms will switch pretty easily between you know, table used for non-virtual tables and table used for virtual tables. And it will switch quite easily between the two or maybe you can make the case that it acquires a broader content that subsumes both. So a uh, use of table which is just neutral between virtual and non-virtual table. I mean, something like this is plausibly already happening with virtual objects in video games for people who go back and forth between you know, Second Life and uh, ordinary non-virtual reality. I mean, to some extent, this is something like a, people talk about switching cases on Twin Earth thought experiments, between, you know, Twin Earth where the watery stuff is made of X, Y, Z, as opposed to H2O here on Earth. You can undergo a very slow switch where after five years on Twin Earth without knowing it, your word water comes to mean X, Y, Z. Well, I think likewise, if you very slowly entered virtual reality without knowing it, after five years in the matrix, maybe your word table applies appropriately to virtual tables. But when you know you're on Twin Earth, it's going to happen a lot faster. If, you, if we actually went back and forth between Earth and Twin Earth and had the, they say, you know, don't drink the water or don't drink the Twin Water, then um, pretty plausibly you'd undergo some kind of pretty automatic switch where water would switch in content from H2O to XYZ or maybe acquire a broader disjunctive content. I think the same is very likely correct about knowledgeable back and forth between non-virtual and virtual reality, much faster switching of content. There are a couple of open questions here, which I'll raise before closing. One is, what are the, what's the precise conditions for representing virtual objects in virtual space? I already raised the question for you know, non-illusorily representing the position of objects in mirrors. The same issue very much comes up with virtual space. When do we move from illusion to veridical perception in use of a VR? And in virtue of what? I don't have any precise answer to that question. Second open question is what to say about cases of mixed perception of virtual and real environments, as in the use of augmented reality. If virtual objects are distinguishable, as I think will often be the case, then perhaps one will get cognitive orientation for those objects with an associated phenomenology of virtuality. If they're not distinguishable, if you've got seamless virtual and non-virtual worlds, maybe this should be regarded as some form of cognitive orientation to a disjunctive virtual and non-virtual world. But I think the questions here are, are difficult and deserve analysis. Okay, so to conclude, I'm inclined to think, say that in everyday interactions with virtual reality, at least for a familiar expert user of virtual reality, things are very much as they seem to be much as in ordinary reality, and subjects are not undergoing perceptual illusions. I see all this as one part of making a, a general case about an issue which is going to come to seem more and more pressing, I think, as virtual reality technology becomes more and more ubiquitous. A general question, is virtual reality a kind of second-class reality? Uh, um, what in Australia we call uh, Clayton's reality. Clayton's drink was the drink you have when you're not having a drink. Is virtual reality the reality you have when you're not having reality? Just a, a second class, merely derivative, merely, you know, a mere similar cram of reality, or is it a first class reality in its own right? Although our intuitions in this domain tend very much to favor the intuition that virtual reality is a second class reality, I'm inclined to think those reality, those intuitions are actually somewhat misleading. And virtual reality on reflection can be seen to have much of the ontological status of an ordinary, ordinary non-virtual reality. That's a case I'll continue to develop as these lectures go along, but the, uh, the points I'll be making today about perceptual illusion can be seen as at least an initial plank in that case. Thank you very much. Uh, can you bring back the picture of the uh, the contrast pair picture? The contrast pair. You know, there was a kind of a mirror that could be seen as a so window. It was. No, no, no. The uh, you know, oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, 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 that one. So, I share with you the intuition that. Um, the phenomenology is not the same for the for the innocent um, perceiver and the sophisticated perceiver. 
But there's also the intuition that there is some strong commonality between the two, a phenomenal commonality. And so what, how are we going to account for the commonality? One view would be, one mistaken view, I think, would be to say, well, it's the same features that are being presented. But it sounds like that's not enough because if we re rearrange the furniture in the right way, we could have the same features, but we feel like saying placed in a different location in space. So it's more like the same feature at the same locations kind of uh, commonality. And so, uh, well, what do you say about that? Yeah, so there's certainly, yeah, I certainly have the intuition there's something phenomenal in common between the cases. And it's not totally obvious what's in common. One thing to say that I think is quite natural is to, if we think about 2D phenomenology versus 3D phenomenology, of course, many of the, of the great historical thinkers thought that visual phenomenology was fundamentally 2D and then all the depth somehow came later. I'm not necessarily inclined to endorse that view, but I do think we can make sense of the idea of the 2D projection of the character of phenomenology which is somehow not sensitive to depth perception. And then I think one could very naturally say that the two-dimensional character of visual experience um, is the same whether one knows it's a mirror and sees it all as being over here or knows it's a window and takes it all to be present over there. So that will at least be some initial component of, uh, of what's in common. Maybe you want more than that? I do. Um, but it doesn't, that doesn't seem it seems like the 2D um, sensory array, let's say, is not really, does not show up in the phenomenology in the same way that the, um, the sunset inside the road, does a, there's a sensory array, let's call it, that, that, um, that matches that description, but it's not, that's, that doesn't show up in the phenomenology really. But can I offer you another, uh, it's maybe, I suspect you're not going to like this, but uh, another diagnosis of the commonality. So, suppose I'm, I'm flying an airplane over huge mansions somewhere uh, in Bel Air, and I can, I can if, if everything goes right, I can have a kind of a weird phenomenology where on the one hand I experience these houses as huge and on the other hand I can uh, experience them as very small because I'm in an airplane and I'm very far from them and they look very small. So how can, how can they be experienced both as small and as large? One approach is to say, well, there's, we should distinguish size sub A from size sub R. A is for absolute and R is for relative. And so I can have a phenomenology of these mansions as being big sub A and small sub R. And could you say that in this case, there, the commonality, so there are two kinds of spatial properties, spatial properties sub R and spatial properties sub A. And the, the phenomenal commonality concerns the, represent, the representing of spatial locations sub, spatial properties sub R, and the uh, dissimil phenomenal dissimilarity has to do with the um, uh, spatial properties sub A. Yeah, that's a reasonable enough line to take. I mean, this issue comes up very much in the discussion of perceptual constancies, uh, where some people are inclined to think that we do perceive the small, you know, the, the ellipticality of the tilted coin and the smallness of the trees in the distance. Exactly how to analyze those properties is up for grabs. I mean, the 2D projection is obviously one way. Uh, something like subtended visual angle is another way. Maybe we perceive the subtended visual angle. I am inclined to think that if you're inclined to make those moves in any of those standard cases involving distances in depth and perceived size at a perceived distance, the same moves ought to be able to be made, uh, to be made here. I mean, the cost will be you'll get no more commonality between perceiving what's through the window and perceiving what's in the mirror than you do between the cases of you know, Peacock's tree at that distance and a double-sized tree at that distance. But it's at least not immediately obvious to me that there is more commonality in this case than in that case, in which case, yeah, we can probably use the same apparatus.
So, um, thanks for a fascinating talk. I, I wanted to explore two small points just to see the, an understanding of a general picture. There seems to be a difference between virtual reality and mirrors in the sense that the knowledgeable use of mirrors, you have um, the same space that you are talking about. That is, you can turn back and it is there and it controls what you see in the mirror. In the case of virtual reality, it's a computation, it's a simulation. You can make a case that you can generate a space which is exactly like the space around you, and that, but that would be a limit case of virtual reality. Virtual reality in the first place is to generate a completely different space in, in which you want to evolve. This is one, one question. The second is iteration. So suppose you have sort of a sort of evidence that we live in the matrix. There are some blurs at the edge of the image that you can spot sometimes, something that gives you some evidence that we live in the matrix. And in the matrix, at some point, someone produces a virtual reality device. Uh, there is Facebook in the matrix. Of course, we live in the matrix, so there is Facebook in the matrix. And they give you this, uh, how is it called? I forgot the name. The Oculus Rift. The Oculus thing. So you wear it, and you have a number of interesting philosophical options here. So one option is that uh, you see the real world, the God's world. So you access to that. And or you can see exactly the same world as we are in, so sort of an iteration. So I, I point out this case because you want a distinction between the, say, illusory case and the real case. You, you want to have, we seem to have conceptual resources to make a distinction between those cases, cases in which you really access the real space and cases in which you access uh, you don't access anything, you just are in front of an illusion. So uh, it, it's not completely clear from what you say that you can still have those resources for making the difference between the different cases. Yeah, thanks. Um, both really interesting points. You're right about the difference between virtual realities and mirrors. Mirrors is just a reorientation of ordinary space, whereas my claim about cognitive orientation to VR is it's a representation of a wholly new sort of space. So in that sense, the claim about virtual reality is more radical. Someone who wanted to concede the point about mirrors while not conceding the point about VR could keep the line, no, in VR, we're still perceiving things to be out there in ordinary space where they're not. Nothing is arranged like that in ordinary space. And that would be a reasonable and respectable way to hold the line. I think it becomes harder to take that line once one starts thinking about things like the robot case in ordinary space where yeah, you represent it as being somewhere else in space then, okay, what, what's going on when we use VR? Are we representing it as being somewhere else in an ordinary space? Or are we representing all oh, this is going on in a wholly different ordinary non-virtual space? But at least there are, there are lines one, uh, one could take there that are very much worth exploring. But I do agree that the claim about virtual, that there is a difference in virtual reality, and therefore that I'm making a stronger claim. The virtual reality inside the matrix, okay. So the idea is we're in the matrix, and then uh, Oculus, Matrix Oculus people develop VR and they give us VR inside the matrix. So what are we now actually perceiving? One point about this is, um, it's actually, I thought about this recently in the context of Putnam's old argument about brains and vats, which is relevantly connected to this, which is a brain in a vat could never actually perceive a brain in a vat because what they call brains, what they call brains aren't brains in vats. Well, because they're different kinds of things. The idea is, I suppose, brains are biological and the things they're seeing are computational. Well, I think Putnam gets this wrong in the one case where we're, in the case you mentioned, where we're, um, I'm sorry, I'm, Jerome, I'm, just, I'm, I'm distracted. Jerome. Jerome. I'm sorry, I can't talk to, I can't. Um, um, so in the case where we're VR in the matrix, then, um, in fact, what we're perceiving when we, when we see virtual people out there, uh, virtual bodies, is the same character as, as our actual body. They're all virtual. They're virtual all the way down. So this is a case where a brain, a, a being inside a matrix, will be seeing objects in the image, which are continuous with the objects in the outside world. They're both computational and virtual. Um, but what you said at the end about the difference between the uh, illusory and the, uh, the real case, We've got these intuitions there's a difference between an illusory and a real case, but I don't know how many of these intuitions I want to hold on to. I can hold on to some intuitions about illusions inside a matrix. The intuition, though, that perception inside a matrix is illusory isn't one that 
I want to hold on to. So I'm inclined to think that, yeah, the person in a matrix within a matrix or VR within a matrix is accurately perceiving a virtual space, as is the person outside. Uh, the person in the matrix is not using an Oculus Rift inside the matrix. They're both accurately perceiving a virtual space. There is an illusion that all, some intuition that all of these people are undergoing some kind of illusion. That for none of them is the world exactly um, as it seems. And in the later lectures, in particular in the third lecture, I'm going to explore a way of making sense of that intuition, tied to the idea that we've got a pre-theoretic idea of Edenic space. Space as it seems to us, totally pre-theoretically, you know, intuitively as it was in the Garden of, um, in the garden of Eden. And to be in a matrix involves some kind of fall from Eden. Space is not as it pre-theoretically seemed to us. All I'd say to that is that um, insofar as there's a fall from Eden inside virtual reality, there's also a fall from Eden inside, say, a quantum mechanical world. So already there, things are going to be not meeting the standard of Edenic perception. So I do want to say that perception inside a virtual reality is at least as good as perception inside a quantum mechanical reality. But perhaps there's some sense that in both cases, things aren't quite as good as they could be. Oh, pardon me. The cognition affects phenomenology, but uh, I wanted to know uh, what kind of phenomenology is affected by your um, cognition, because uh, it could be the phenomenology of your visual perception, or it could be something else. Like, to take an example, um, we know the cases where you look at the face and it feels familiar, but in this case, it sounds like the feeling of familiarity doesn't have anything to do with your perceptual experience. So I wonder, um, what is the phenomenology which is um, modified by your cognition? Is it really a visual experience or is it something else? Like uh, the familiarity in the case of the face, for example. So what is the phenomenology yeah, on... Which, which kind of phenomenology is affected by your cognition? In looking in a mirror? Yeah, yeah, for example, like um, when you have this illusion with the little girl and you feel like if she doesn't have a body, what is affected? Is it your, um, the, your vis visual uh, perception or is it something else, like the impression that she doesn't have a body? I see. I'm inclined to think some special things going on in that particular case, and I'm not certain what's the best thing to say about that case. In the general case of mirror illusions versus reality, where the issue is, do you perceive something is going on behind the glass or in front of the glass, I'm inclined to think the key feature is the representation of space and of the location of things in space. In the illusory case, you represent something is going on over there behind the glass. In the non-illusory case, you represent things as going on on this side of the glass. And even that's going on in this case with the grass. The grass you're actually perceiving, I was taking it, is on this side of the grass, of the glass, sorry. The grass is on this side of the glass, but you perceive it as being on that side of the glass, and that's an illusion. Now, in this case, which involves a human body and a human face, there are many other things going on involving a you know, discontinuous human body. In cases involving seeing yourself in a mirror, there's also a really interesting question. Do you perceive that person as yourself or as some twin of yourself? I'm inclined to think you perceive that person as yourself, but I understand there are, some, there are going to be some very delicate issues about that tied to the fact that that person doesn't exactly seem to be inhabiting your body. This actually connects to some interesting stuff I've recently heard about from people who play World of Warcraft a lot, which is that um, there is the possibility of taking a first-person perspective in World of Warcraft and inhabiting the body image from the inside, but people find that kind of weird and creepy because you don't get a good enough sense of your own body. So people actually prefer to play World of Warcraft from the perspective about a meter behind their body looking down at it, because then they can see their body move, and they've got a much better sense of proprioception of inhabiting their own body. So I'd be likewise inclined to say that when you look at your own body in a mirror, this is totally consistent with it being having a strong sense of self-identification. But, but the bottom line is when it comes to the aspects of the illusion beyond space, I don't, I don't have a well worked out view. Okay. I'll, I'll so, no, it's fine. Um, I also want to thank you for the fascinating talk. I'm, um, I'm trying to. Are you? It's not a real mic. So okay. Good. Oh, it's just for recording. Okay. Um, 
you seem to put a lot of explanatory force on the notion of cognitive orientation, and I'm a little worried about that. Um, what makes a cognitive orientation, and what are the limits of having one? So I think in your story, if I convinced you by whatever I do that you are actually not sitting on the floor, but on the ceiling because I have an evil gravity inverter, and I would make you think that this is really what happens right now, your story would predict that your perception switches and you actually now perceive yourself as sitting on the ceiling and not on the floor. And coming from Kevin O'Reddington's lab, I think that is not possible unless you have sensory motor experience that supports this view. So what's your, what's your notion on cognitive orientation? Where does that come from? What are the limits? Um, yes, yeah, so as in the case of cognitive penetration, cognitive orientation has very strong limits. So, you know, this, this is already a familiar dialectic in the, for people who believe in cognitive penetration. People say, well, if there can be cognitive penetration, if what you know or believe can affect what you perceive, why doesn't it do this all the time? How do we ever get illusions? I mean, after all, I know that the stick is straight. Why do I still see it as bent? So one thing we've learned from, cognitive, from the discussion of cognitive penetration is that even where it exists, it's extremely limited. Um, it's certainly not the case that cognition always and automatically corrects your perception to match what you know. And I'm inclined to say the same is true for a cognitive orientation. It works in some contexts, but it's certainly not going to provide an orientation that corrects. So your case of, yeah, just because I know I'm on the floor rather than on the ceiling, that knowledge is not going to provide an automatic corrective to my perception. But what is the difference? Why do you in one case know if it's a reality or a mirror can work? Well, you know, well, yeah, so I tried to get at a few of the things which make a difference when I gave that list of four conditions about what's special about the car case, but it's an extremely incomplete list. And furthermore, I take it, it's, it's got to be a, a deeply empirical question about something to do with brain plasticity and brain, brain adaptation. In some cases, we just, the perceptual system is just very good at adjusting. I think the mirror case is one. Other cases, like the bent the ben stick case, it's just it just doesn't uh, adjust, and there's no way of correcting that perceptual misrepresentation. Then there's a whole range of cases in between, and I think it's, it's probably going to come down to a very deeply empirical question about the wiring of the visual areas in the brain. Yes, um, I think you have. I haven't heard your other lectures yet, so I don't know if you'll get, get to this point, so let me ask you a question about a question. In the Baudrillard example, um, there's no virtual reality, we, we can't get outside of it. And that's the premise, the beginning premise of the Matrix movement, the movie, except they screw it up by putting a Jesus figure in it. And, and the red pill, right? Yeah. Now this is the same time that the film The Truman Show was made and the same time uh, uh, Wag the Dog was made. So it was a fascination with the question you're posing. Um, my question is towards your issue of intuition. Um, in, in the epistemological sense, it, it's very interesting what you argue, but, and you show images of people putting on and taking off virtual reality devices very voluntarily, but the world that I see coming is not voluntary, that it's closer to Baudrillard and the Matrix than it is to the abstract philosophical notion of deciding what's real and what's not real. So is there in some sense a power dimension, this analysis of what one sees and what one does not see? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, certainly a, a fair point. And I think, I guess I'm inclined to say that power, you know, temporary versus, sorry, voluntary versus enforced, to some extent will cross cut permanent versus temporary. But um, I suppose it's natural to think of the permanent VR case as being non-voluntary. Um, you know, in the matrix, we were put in the permanent VR by the machines, possibly against our will. Certainly people who are born into it don't get any say in it. Whereas temporary use of VR, it's natural to think of as something we do voluntarily, at least at first. Uh, that said, one can certainly envisage the possibility of enforced use of, uh, of VR uh, just say, for example, that, you know, I mean, there's different things that could happen. One is that people could actually, you know, lock you up inside, a, uh, inside an Oculus Rift and say, here's where you're going to spend your time doing, um, I don't know, doing special answering calls in a call center for us inside a, inside a VR. Or maybe it's just going to be semi-enforced VR because the conditions in a non-virtual world might get to be so bad that everyone is basically forced to spend their time inside a VR because that's the only tolerable way to... Uh, 
to live a life. And those do raise questions about, um, about the value, I think, of being in a VR and whether it's a good or a bad situation. I'm inclined to think that it doesn't make that much difference to the question of whether, you're, whether your perception is illusory or not, or at least it will only make a difference to that insofar as it connects with the question of whether we know we're in a VR or not. If people fool us into thinking we're in a VR, into being in, if people fool us into thinking we're an ordinary reality when we're actually in a VR, then maybe that could lead to illusions. Do you think the notion of Excuse me, sorry, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. We really are running out of time. And I also I apologize for all the people who had questions. The good news is that there are three other lectures where we have more time for questions. But today is a kind of special session because this is also the day where um, uh, Dave Chalmers will receive the jean Nico Prize. So now I will just invite uh, Jérôme Dukic from the EHSS, uh, Marie-Guy uh, from the SNRS, and Yves Laszlo from the NS to come to the table. And there will be more discussion next time, I promise. And I think we should thank again Dave for this wonderful talk. Euh, donc très brièvement, euh, au nom de la présidence de l'École des hautes études en sciences sociales, euh, euh, je voudrais remercier Dave Chalmers d'être là et d'avoir donné une superbe conférence. Je voulais rappeler que l'École des hautes études en sciences sociales est associée au, au prix jean Nico, aux conférences jean Nico depuis 2001. Mais comme euh, marie Gaille le rappellera, les conférences jean Nico sont, sont plus anciennes que cela. Et l'École des hautes études est très heureuse de, de continuer à promouvoir évidemment les relations entre sciences sociales et euh, sciences cognitives. Et je termine juste en disant que cet événement a été inscrit dans la semaine d'anniversaire de l'EHESS, puisque cette, euh, non pas aujourd'hui, mais cette année, le 40e anniversaire de l'École des hautes études en sciences sociales, donc il y a eu une semaine d'événements anniversaires. Alors on est à la fin de la semaine, mais demain, il y a encore une journée, si ça vous intéresse, tout est sur le site hein, de l'École des hautes études. Euh, demain, par exemple, il y a une un colloque sur art, sciences et littérature, donc où il y aura un petit peu de sciences cognitives aussi. Et donc la conférence de Dave aujourd'hui s'inscrit, et la remise du prix aussi, dans, dans cette semaine anniversaire. Le HSS est très heureuse de, de pouvoir le faire. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to say a few words on the occasion of the prix Jean Nico awarded by David Chalmers. Um, so uh, we are here, three institutions from uh, PSL, and it's also a pleasure to be here uh, for this reason. So um, it's my pleasure not only uh, because we share uh, with uh, David the same kind of education through mathematics, because um, I am a mathematician. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to explain, to briefly explain how cognitive sciences are important at ENS. So cognitive sciences have quickly become central to the scientific strategy of the École Normale Supérieure. Our Department of Cognitive Studies is relatively young since in, it has been founded only 50, 15 years ago. Still, in this short period, it has become one of the leading centers in France and Europe. This has been made possible thanks to the cooperation of CNRS, EHSS, and ENS on the one hand, and on the other hand, thanks to an ambitious multidisciplinary research program and human cognitions, putting together humanities, for instance, philosophy, linguistics, and anthropology, which are particularly well represented at the Institut Jean Nico, and hard sciences. At the beginning of the 21st century, we, clear, we clearly are at the crossing point in the study of life and also brain activity with the move from a qualitative phenomenological uh, approach to a quantitative approach allowed by multidisciplinary corporations. The question of finding the relevant parameters describing life and mental activities is certainly one of the major, major issues of contemporary science. 
In this context, a very innovative questioning of Professor Chalmers with his hard questions about consciousness, hard questions which precisely are not reducible to simple mechanistic descriptions, is certainly a cornerstone of a better understanding of human cognition and of the irreducible parameters of life and mind. It's therefore my pleasure to, congratul to congratulate Professor Chalmers for his award of the Prix Jean Nicot. Thank you. Thank you. So we hold the microphone, but just for the records. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Yes, I will speak louder. So it was in 1996 that uh, the prize uh, Jean Nico and the conference that uh, uh, go uh, with this prize was created by the CNRS in order to develop and promote uh, cognitive sciences in France and to correlate this development with international uh, collaboration and uh, um, uh, works in the field of cognitive, cognitive sciences that were developed elsewhere. So you will be the 21st uh, person that is awarded by uh, this prize. And uh, as uh, Jérôme uh, reminded us, uh, the CNRS uh, uh, was um, uh, gathered with the EHESS and the Ecole Normale uh, to uh, keep on with this work of uh, uh, giving structures to the cognitive science and to develop them. And we have with the Institut Jean Nico one of the leading research uh, units in this field in France and abroad. Um, we had to interrupt the uh, discussion with David Chalmers, but I want to say that you will have the opportunity to continue the dialogue with him as he will stay in Paris until mid-July, uh, since the conference, the annual meeting of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness will take place here in Paris from the 7th to the 10th of July and is organized by an association of which I think you are one of the founders. Um, everybody here speaks English, however, uh, I would like to mention the French translation of your 1996 book, The Conscious Mind in Search of a Fundamental Theory. It was published in French in 2010. And I think it's a good um, sign or symptom of a um, um, non-going debate in France about all problems, but still a very contemporary question about uh, imagination, consciousness, self-reflection. The sociologist uh, Alain Renberg labeled this debate uh, as a war, a war about the subject. And I think that your original way of conceiving self-reflection and consciousness is a very important piece of this debate and also enables cognitive sciences to fully participate uh, in this debate. I was personally very interested in your conference about virtual reality as uh, in the non-virtual world of pathologies and therapeutic uh, field, uh, we see more and more virtual tools uh, develop uh, in order to cure people uh, from various mental uh, mental disease. So I think it's a very important topic to be tackled today. I also, uh, on following the advice of Frédéric, <laughs> uh, had an eye uh, today uh, to your more uh, humoristic and uh, 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 side of uh, your website and uh, at work. I, I was uh, considering your photo gallery and I was very happy to see that uh, your uh, work uh, about consciousness, self-reflection, virtual reality takes place in a happy gathering <laughs> and uh, with a lot of exchange with colleagues. Um, I was very pleased to see this because I, uh, from this photo gallery and other works you published, uh, we can see that your work is um, implied, is involved in a web of collaborations and very much dedicated to the transmission of your research. and. For uh, this reason, besides the importance of your uh, research, I'm very pleased uh, on behalf of the CNRS uh, to uh, offer you this prize, uh, Jean-Nico, uh, for your uh, research. Thank you very much.